decision to make. Tonight, two candidates for the 13th Congressional District face off before the July runoff. Republican candidates Ronnie Jackson and Josh Weingarner try to separate themselves on the issues that matter most from your local election headquarters. Airing now on KFDX3 and our sister stations in Amarillo and Abilene. The 13th Congressional District Republican Debate starts now. From your election headquarters, welcome to the Republican Congressional Debate for District 13. We're live now in Wichita Falls for this Next Star Media Group special presentation. I'm Daryl Franklin. I'm the evening anchor at KFDX TV3 and Texomas Fox in Wichita Falls. And I'm Jackie Kingston, a evening anchor and executive producer for KAMR Local 4 News in Amarillo. We will be serving as your moderators tonight. Happy to be doing so. We've taken measures to keep everyone safe this evening. As you can see, we're following the CDC's coronavirus virus social distancing guidelines. The candidates and we moderators all six feet apart at least and we have no live studio audience. And for those of you at home be sure to follow all of this action tonight on social media using the hashtag TX13 debate. That's where you'll get live updates from behind the scenes as well as additional information on the questions that we are going to be asking tonight. We're going to start off with some key information about the 13th Congressional District and the candidates who you will hear from within the next hour. The 13th Congressional District spans nearly 40 counties, including most of the Texas Panhandle, parts of Texoma, into the South Plains. So to put that in perspective, the district covers more land mass than 13 different states. The district has been represented by Republican Congressman Mac Thornberry, who was first elected in 1994. Thornberry announced late last year he would not be seeking re-election. During a runoff election on July 14th, voters will finalize which Democratic and Republican primary candidate will be on the ballot for the November general election. Mark your calendars. Early voting starts on Monday. Now let's go ahead and introduce you to the two gentlemen looking to be the Republican nominee for Congressional District 13. You have Ronnie Jackson on the right here and Josh Weingarner. Weingarner was born and raised in the Panhandle. He attended Hardin-Simmons University in Abilene. His legislative career includes working for former U.S. Senator Phil Graham and Senator John Cornyn. Josh Weingarner has also served the Texas Cattle Feeders Association for more than a decade now, and he also has the endorsement of Congressman Thornberry. Also on the stage tonight, retired U.S. Navy Admiral Ronnie Jackson. He's from the Lubbock area, Leveland, which is just outside District 13. Dr. Jackson spent 25 years of the military before serving as White House physician under three presidents, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. And Dr. Jackson has the endorsement of President Donald Trump. Here's a quick rundown of our rules for this evening. As you can see, each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer the main question, 30 seconds then for rebuttal if needed, 30 seconds for a follow-up. When that time is up, candidates will hear this bell. There are no opening statements tonight, but each candidate will get 60 seconds for closing remarks at the end of our debate. Before this debate, we held a card draw to determine who will go first. That honor tonight goes to Josh Weingarner, who will get our first question. Okay, and this is going to center around the coronavirus, something that's affecting everyone right now, and, you know, just like it is people here in District 13. Health and government officials shut down the country during the early spread of coronavirus. They did that to flatten the curve. They did that so there would be enough hospital beds for the mass uh, number of people who were expected to be hospitalized. Now, with numbers again rising, but with still plenty of hospital beds available, could you, Mr. Weingarner, see yourself supporting another shutdown? Absolutely not. We cannot close down our economy again. We can't let the remedy for this Chinese virus be worse than the, the implications of the virus itself. Uh, we've got to continue to have our, our economy running, our businesses open so that they can continue to provide for their families. Uh, we've seen a number of people that are struggling because of this, because they haven't been able to work, because the mitigation efforts themselves, not the virus, but the mitigation efforts were the, were the things that, that really hurt people's paychecks. And we, we can't allow that to continue or we'll have even more long-term ramifications for our economy. 
Okay, you have a little time left. Would you like to go ahead and send it over to Dr. Jackson? Sure. Dr. Jackson, you have 60 seconds. Absolutely not. Uh, this, uh, this is not going to shut our economy down again. You know, the president uh, stepped up to the plate, did the right thing early on. He shut down uh, travel from China and uh, travel from Europe whenever we didn't know a lot about this virus. We've learned an incredible bit, a lot about this virus in the meantime. Uh, we've learned that the mortality rate's probably close to 0.1 percent. We were initially told that the mortality rate was going to be about 10 percent. Now that we've educated ourselves, we know from experience what this virus is really capable of. We know what the vulnerable populations are, being the really elderly uh, and those uh, that have pre-existing conditions. We need to continue to take care of those and keep them a little bit, uh, you know, uh, social distance and, 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 and be careful with them. But the rest of us have to get back to work at this point. Knowing what we know about this virus, I can promise you there's no way. This virus might come back in the fall, but it will not shut our economy down again. It's just not going to happen. Today, the USDA and President Trump announced that they would give $86 million in additional funding to strengthen and to um, make more available broadband internet in our rural communities. There has been an education gap forming between students who have Wi-Fi and who do not have Wi-Fi during this time where schools have been shut down. How do we catch those students up? Dr. Jackson, this is to you first. How do we catch those students up who are not able to attend school during the coronavirus shutdown? Well, we've got to get that broadband out there. We've got to do that. I mean, broadband's a huge issue in this district for a variety of reasons, not just because of the education and the fact that, you know, we have students now that can't attend school and to rely on broadband uh, for their education, but we have a big issue with our rural hospitals. You know, I've been traveling around the district, district with uh, Texas Ag Commissioner Sid Miller. We've been talking a lot about the issues of rural hospitals that are out there, the fact that, you know, we need telemedicine to, uh, to continue to be a robust part of what we're doing in this country. So I think the president's stepping up and, and giving some money, uh, providing providing some money for broadband is going to do a lot for this district. You know, people ask me all the time, how can we bring industry to this district? Well, we can't bring industry to this district unless we have things that people need on a day-to-day -day basis. Education and health care are two of the biggest things that we need. Those in the rural parts of Texas, I grew up in a rural farming community. I know what it's like. They rely on broadband at this point to provide Aaron both of those services. And it's incredibly uh, important that we studio. do that, and I thank the president for doing that. Mr. Jackson, the same question to you. Excuse me, Mr. Weingarten. Uh, that's fine. I, I agree completely. The, the importance of broadband you. is is it's huge in this district, and it can be a real game changer for not just education, but for all of our businesses uh, and for our everyday lives. <clears throat> One of the things that, that we experienced during COVID was that when you have two working parents on Zoom calls, and then you've got two kids doing Google Classroom work, uh, even when you have really good broadband, it, it still goes down. I mean, we've got to not just have the fiber to the homes, we've got to make sure that we have a high-speed connection so that we can all continue to work. This is a, a great opportunity for us to, to really benefit our rural communities in addition to telemedicine, but it, it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to close that divide and allow people that would rather live and work in a rural community to do so and telecommute to one of the cities. And I think that that creates a, a new dynamic because you keep young families in rural communities and uh, you increase the, the number of kids in the schools, you increase the, 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 the participation in other parts of your community. If another public health crisis were to happen or a second wave of COVID-19, start with you, Josh Weingartner, what would you like to see handled differently if you were elected to District 13? Well, I, I think the thing that, that, that we have to look at is that President Trump Senior. and Governor Abbott did a great job with the information that they had available. We know that the Chinese lied to us. We know that, uh, that they hoarded their own PPE. Okay. I guess, um, they shut down their own internal uh, flights, but they yes, didn't sir. shut there. down the international <laughs> flights. So we saw that spread Bye. because of that. Bye. We've got to hold the Chinese accountable. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I was so surprised when I heard my opponent tell a Fox News anchor that uh, he believed the numbers that were coming out of China. And then, and again, and again he, in his latest financial report, he actually works for a Chinese company that is selling a holistic herbal remedy for coronavirus. Uh, so I, I'd like to hear more information about why he's working for this Chinese company. Okay, you have 30 seconds. I'd like to tell you, first you need to clean the wax out of your ears. I never said anything about believing the numbers that are coming out of Wahoo, out of Wahoo, uh, out of China. I never said a single word about that. It's on your That's Facebook That's another page. ridiculous lie. You know, I thought we got in this race that we were going to both uh, step yeah. before the voters. That was my mistake. You have 60 seconds. Yeah, I thought we were going to we were going to step up to the voters and we were going to tell the voters what we can do for the district, what we bring to this fight. Tell them about our background and who we 
we are and let the voters decide. My opponent has already taken a different path. He's decided to recycle a bunch of garbage and lies. And now he's adding new lies. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. I can't believe that you actually stand up here. You produce some evidence of that. You go ahead and right do here. that. You produce it right there. I, have, I, don't, I don't work for anybody. I live off of my Navy retirement right now. I live off my Navy retirement completely. I'm not getting any other source of income. So that is a bold face lie. And it's in keeping with all the other lies that you're spreading out there right now. It's, it's, it's shameful, it's disgraceful, and it's a desperate move. Desperate times will reveal a man's character, and that's what we're seeing right here. This man's desperate. He knows that the only way that he can beat me is to spread lies and try to tear me down, not tell the voters what he can do for the district. Mr. Weingarten, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I think it's, it's completely okay for us to know who the person that we're going to go in and vote for or against who they're working for. I mean, his financial disclosure statement that he filed himself says that he is a consultant for a group called uh, Yeehaw, or Yeehaw uh, Consulting, and one of your clients is Dejia LLC, who is a Chinese company buying property in the United States and also has a, a, an herbal remedy for the coronavirus. Your rebuttal? You 30 like seconds. That's ridiculous. I, th that, that's from the Lansdowne Resort in, in uh, Virginia, and there was a project to bring Western medicine and Eastern medicine together in a spa, in a uh, medical spa platform. Uh, I gave some, I did some consulting on that early on before this election uh, started, and it's ridiculous for you to say something like that. I actually live day to day on my Navy retirement right now as we speak, and for you to bring something like that up is just another desperate, desperate attempt from an empty vessel uh, of the campaign that, that your campaign represents right okay. now. We must move on, but you'll have another opportunity in your closing statement if you'd like to back up and address this again. Yes. Dr. Jackson, this question now goes to you. Um, we, another major thing that our nation is facing and that our district is facing here in District 13 is the Black Lives Matter movement. What is your opinion on police reform? Well, I think that, you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Republicans in, in the House and the Senate right now are coming up with something. Apparently, the, uh, the Democrats in the Senate today uh, shot down what would have been a uh, good uh, apparently an 80% solution that the other side would have accepted. So I think that the Democrats don't want police reform right now. That's not what they're after right now. They're, they want to keep this alive and use it as a campaign uh, issue, and that's, that's all this is about, much the same way that allowing the riots and uh, you know, the lawlessness that's going around this country, and the coronavirus for that matter, uh, to, to dictate what's going on politically. But I think this is not about the death of Mr. Floyd anymore. I think that this has evolved, and there are, guys, there are people out there uh, that are criminals, uh, that are anarchists, uh, that are out uh, taking advantage of law-abiding citizens and their neighbors and destroying property uh, and killing. And, uh, and, and, and I think that this has is, this is evolved way beyond uh, anything to do with the, the death of Mr. Floyd. I think that was a horrible thing that happened, but that's not what this is about anymore. And we have to take control of it. So I think I'm, I'm a huge supporter of our police, and I want us all to come together and support our police, and I want to get law and order back in this country. Mr. Weingartner, the same question to you. Your opinion on police reform? Yeah, I, I'm a strong supporter of our law enforcement agencies and all of those that, that, that put on the uniform, put on a badge, and go out and protect us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I, I appreciate that sacrifice of not only them, but also their families. Uh, and, you know, the last thing that we need to do is defund the police. That would create a, a terrible situation for all of us. We need to provide more resources to our law enforcement agencies because they're the ones that are protecting us. They're also, when they have those resources, they can ensure that they have the best and the brightest out always patrolling and enforcing our laws. So we've got to continue to have a strong law enforcement community uh, to protect us on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I would also say that, that you know, in, in all professions, there are bad actors. Uh, and we need to weed out those bad actors and make sure that, that again, that we have the best and brightest always out guarding us, protecting us from those that wish to do us harm. Okay, this question to uh, Mr. Weingarner, and it uh, follows what you were saying, Dr. Jackson, too, about the horrible death of George Floyd. What should be done to make sure that what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others does not happen again to people of color in America? 60 seconds. Sure, I, I think that the, the thing that, that will matter the most is being continue to be active in the community. We don't talk enough about the, the good things that, that our police officers, our, our sheriff's officers do on a day-to-day -day basis to be part of their community and really become a, a known commodity that, that, that is really working with all of the, the different people in the community. So that is one, is to continue to encourage that. But when you provide the resources, again, this is why defunding the police is such a terrible idea. When they have the resources that they can use 
uh, to get out and be a community policing force uh, to really be part of that community, then I think that w we stop seeing the same types of terrible acts that have happened. Okay, Dr. Jackson. Well, Mr. Weingarten, I'll stand up here and tell you that he supports law enforcement, and I'm sure he does to some extent. He'll, he's also going to tell you before this night's over how much he supports President Trump and stands behind President Trump. But I just want to remind everybody out there that I am the one that has this, the endorsement of the Wichita Falls Police Department, of the Amarillo Police Department, and of the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, not Mr. Weingarten. But I'll tell you what we need to do to turn this around, is we need, to, we need to take the moral high ground back in this country. We have lost our moral compass in this country. We have had an entire generation of, of young folks that have been brainwashed to think that this is a horrible place to live here in the United States. They don't care about being American and they don't care about our flag and they don't care about being patriotic and they have no respect for our police force. So we need to go back and we need to we need to reestablish a law and order in this country. We need to reestablish respect for our law enforcement in this country. And I think once we do that, if we start treating each other, you know, and live by the golden rule, do unto others we'd have them do unto us. And we realize that God created us all and doesn't matter if we're black or white or what color we are, we're all God's children. We start approaching each other like that this will be a much better place to live. You mentioned your endorsements. Let's go ahead and follow up with that. You'll have 30 seconds. Why is it that you think that uh, you did not get the endorsement from longtime 13th District Congressman Mike Thornberry? Why do you think that is and do you think that's going to hurt you in the polls? It's not going to hurt me. I mean, it's, it's a, it, there's a simple answer to that. You know, um, Congressman Thornberry's been there in for 26 years. He's the ranking member on the Armed Services Committee, which is one of the most powerful positions in the entire House. He's been there for, he will leave. When he leaves Congress, he's not going to come back to the 13th Congressional District. He's going to continue to live uh, in Northern Virginia and work as a lobbyist. He's going to be insanely wealthy working as a lobbyist for the defense industry. And the reason he's picked Mr. Weingarten, Mr. Weingarten was his choice before he even announced that he wasn't going to run again. And if he, if Mr. Weingarten wins this election, then he gets to do that and keep his vote in Congress. Okay, time's up. You have 30 seconds, Mr. Weingarten. To respond to that? Yes. You can well, respond to any of that if you'd uh, like to. Sure. I, I would just say I, I have no idea what Mac's going to do when he retires. I'm nowhere near a hand-picked candidate. I didn't know I was getting in this race until right at the end. I'll tell you what got me into this race was when I was in church and there was a message, three messages in a row, about using the gifts that God gave you to give back to help others and to honor God. And then the third message, when I was asking God, what do you really want me to do? He said, when I tell you, listen. And that's why I got into this race. I've had some great opportunities growing up in this district. I have, uh, I, I, ju I just love where I live. I love the people of this district and it is time. I have experiences that I think can, I can use to benefit all of us in this district and I wanna give back. Gentlemen, um, our, our topic that we were talking about with racial equality in the United States. I want to go back to that and but get outside of the police perspective. What is the key in your opinion to achieving racial equality in the United States? Dr. Jackson, that question goes to you first. Well, like I said, I think that we just have to treat each other like brothers and sisters. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't I don't consider myself a, a, the least bit of a racist. You know, I, I, I go to church uh, with folks that are uh, black and brown and white and you know, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ and I realize that God created them just like he created me. They have the same rights that I have, and uh, uh, you know we need to start treating each other like that. So I just, we need to just step up to the plate, and uh, we need to uh, get past. You know, for eight years during the Obama administration, every single thing that happened in this country was revolved around identity politics: straight, gay, black, white, male, female, everything. And it forced a lot of people in this country to feel like they need to take sides. We don't need to take sides anymore. We're all Americans, and we need to start approaching things like that as Americans, as one country, and as one team. And I think that's how we get around this. Mr. Weingartner, how do you think that we achieve racial equality in the United States? Well, I, I go back to, the, to the, the two commandments that God tells us, that to love God with all your heart, soul, and body, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think if we get back to that, if we embrace that, then we don't have these, these rifts. We don't have these, these, these cultural issues. Uh, we live as a one body. And we are Americans, we're Texans, we're, we're, we're residents of the 13th district. I mean, we are together and if we, if we act like that, if we work like that, and if we pray like that, then we will get, uh, get through this. Okay, this, first, uh, this question first for Mr. Weingarner. What's your opinion no of, the, of the controversial one. statues and monuments? What should be done she about those and do you condone the protesters who are toppling these statues and monuments? Well, we definitely should not remove our, our monuments or rename our bases. Uh, 
you know, th this is our history. Um, it's good or bad, whatever you think of it. This is the history of our country. We, we've gone into even beyond Civil War statues now to trying to pull down the statues of our founding fathers, other leaders of our country, and we can't allow that. That's our history, and we've, we've, we need, what we need to do is teach our kids our history. We need to continue to talk about that, talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and when we do that, then our kids know, and again, we will, we will have a brighter future for it. Okay, same question for you, Dr. Jackson. What should be done with these controversial statues, monuments? Do you condone the protesters who are toppling these? Absolutely not. I mean, we're trying to rewrite history right here. You know, the problem we have right now in this country is that, you know, the Democrats are doing everything they can to just completely restructure this country. You know, they're, they're actually inviting and encouraging folks to come into this country as immigrants who don't really care about being American. I mean, that's one of the big pushes that they've had for a long time. They want to get them over here. They want to give them the right to vote. They want to get everybody in this country on some type of entitlement so they can control the vote. They want to establish mail-in ballots so that they can control the vote. And then they want to change the history and the culture of this country to fit that narrative. And it's just a, it, it's just a big push uh, that's pushing our country in the wrong direction. We've got to step up to the plate. We've got to stop this. We've got to maintain uh, the uh, the historical nature of what's going on. Uh, I do agree that you know there's parts of our history that uh, that, that aren't pleasant that we don't want to uh, you know uh, repeat obviously. But the one best way we don't repeat that is to we 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 keep that out front and we learn from uh, we learn from our mistakes. And so I, I'm not in favor of rewriting the history in this country to fit some narrative uh, that's going on right now on the far left. Dr. Jackson, you mentioned mail-in ballots. That's where I want to take our line of questioning next. Uh, Ken Paxton, our attorney general, is fighting several different lawsuits and has one tied up in the federal court system right now about mail-in ballots. And uh, it's timely, considering that this runoff has been pushed to July. Y'all's race mm -hmm. has been pushed to then. Um, what is your opinion on those mail-in ballots? You obviously don't think they should that should be expanded. I don't think mail-in ballots should be expanded at all. I think it's uh, ripe with uh, corruption. I think that those ballots, you don't know where they're going. You don't know who's harvesting them, who's filling them out, who's throwing them away. You, don't, you have no idea what's happening with those ballots. And it's, it's the grand plan for the, uh, for the far left and for the Democrats to establish something like this so that they can start controlling elections. And that's what will actually happen. So no, I'm not at all in favor of uh, mail-in ballots. I think that uh, you know, it sh they should be reserved for people who can't vote physically, uh, people that are elderly that can't get out. Uh, Mr. Weinergarner pushed out a uh, mail-in ballot request uh, to, his, uh, to, uh, to, to, to folks all over this district, indicating that if they're worried about COVID-19, they should fill it out and tell them they don't want to go to the polls. That's really what the Democrats are trying to do right now, is use this virus and use COVID-19 as an excuse uh, to get mail-in ballots out to everyone. So no, I don't support it. And as a doctor, you and just a quick follow-up, you can condone telling people to go to the polls and voting and in person that amid this pandemic, that's safe? Absolutely. I think that we're going to put uh, precautions in place. And, uh, you know, we know what we're doing right now. We have uh, public health folks that are setting up these polling places, and uh, we're going to maintain the right level of social distancing. And, you know, we know, like I said, we know a lot about this virus, and we know what it can and can't do anymore, and we know what the vulnerable populations are. So I'm all about getting back out right now, getting back to normal, and that includes getting out and voting. Mr. Weingartner, how do you feel about mail-in ballots? Well, let me address his, what he said about me first, Certainly. just real quick. I, I did send out a, a mail-in ballot application. That's been the, the law of the land for, for decades here in Texas. He did too, by the way. Mine didn't uh, say COVID-19. He just didn't talk about it. But yeah, that, it, it's something that, that we've been doing in Texas for a number of years because we do have an elderly population that doesn't always want to go to the polls. We have a you know, people with disabilities, they need to have, we've got people in the military, they need to have the ability to vote if they want to. So we put out the, the, the mail-in ballot and I'm proud of it. As far as pushing out a mail-in ballot completely without an application, I completely oppose that. That is, a, is rife with fraud. It has the ability to, and I've talked with a number of people that have been involved in elections. They know that, that there are uh, registration, your registration cards are sent to people's mailboxes that don't live there anymore. Uh, they've seen it themselves and if we were to do that you wouldn't know who was getting that ballot, you wouldn't know who was filling that ballot out. There could be ballot harvesters driving around picking them up, there could be people printing fake ballots to send them in. Uh, I, I do believe that, that a, just a straight mail-in ballot system would be terrible. Okay, now we have come to the portion of our debate where each of you will be able to ask your opponent a question and you'll each have 60 seconds to respond. And because Mr. Weingarner went first off the top of this debate, Dr. Jackson, you now can ask Mr. Weingarner the question first. 
Well, I'm going to take advantage of this situation. I'm going to ask him a similar question that I've asked him before, so he should be prepared to answer this. Uh, but I'd like to ask Mr. Weingartner why, as the political director and as the lead registered lobbyist for the organization that he works for, did his organization, led by him, give hundreds of thousands of dollars to Democrats all over this country and all over the state of Texas? They gave, uh, they, they gave donations to uh, Henry Kuehler, who's been described as Nancy Pelosi's, uh, Pelosi's uh, staunchest ally, uh, to Julio, uh, to Julian uh, Castro's twin brother, uh, Joaquin Castro, uh, a notorious liberal, far left liberal down in San Antonio, and to numerous other far left folks. And the problem I have with that is regardless of why that money was being given to those people, it elected and re-elected those Democrats that are in our House and in our Senate right now that are fighting every day uh, to make abortion legal, to take your gun rights away from you, to make uh, immigration uh, uh, to, to open our borders and encourage immigration and, and get illegal, give illegal immigrants the right to vote. So I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Weingartner, uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you explain that? Well, I didn't give money to any Democrats. The organization I work for has a PAC board that, that you determines that. I'm not on that. You That's weren't. actually elected individuals or appointed individuals that, that, uh, that want to be on that board they make those determin determinations on who they're going to give contributions to. Uh, I, my, my Republican credentials are uh, without question. I've been an active member of the Republican Party for a number of years. I have been voting in Republican primaries. I've been voting in general elections. And I have continually helped local Republican uh, elected officials uh, throughout the, the time that, that I've been uh, eligible to. So I. I you keep trying to bring this up and attack, but, but those are not the decisions that I made. Those are decisions that people in my organization made because they live in those districts. Okay, just a quick follow-up with Mr. Weingartner. How do you believe that your experience as a lobbyist would help you if you were to be elected to 13th District Congress? Well, I, I think it, it, it's going to be great because I know how to get things done. And I've done that throughout my time with Texas Cattle Feeders. We've been very effective at making sure that, and, and a lot of what I had to do was educating people about the importance of agriculture to this district, educating them about what a cattle feed yard actually is. There are, you know, I'll tell you a story that I overheard where a, 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 five, five a seconds. female congresswoman said that she asked us when we were talking about some labor issues how much we pay our cattle guards. Hmm. I mean, that's just the, the irony here is that people in, in the East, the West, they don't understand how important agriculture is to us in our economy overall. Okay, Mr. Weingartner, your opportunity now to ask a question of Dr. Jackson. I, I guess I, I'm just gonna go back to, uh, uh, to one of the questions I've asked you too. Um, you, you continue to say that, that you voted in every election, but Hockley County, where you're from in Leveland, has no indication that you even requested a ballot for any of the elections that you didn't vote in. And I think there are probably eight to 10 of them. So I, I'm just gonna ask again, why didn't you vote for President Trump when he was running against Hillary Clinton. I did vote for President Trump, and that's part of the reason. I voted absentee in the United States military. Not all of us have the opportunity to walk. I, I voted Maryland. where I was assigned on active I duty, Mr. Weingartner. But it wasn't I'm like you were apologize. overseas. I'm not going to, well, you don't know where I was. I was in Afghanistan part of that time right before the election. You don't know. You keep saying you were in the White House. I was, I was in the White House. I was in Afghanistan traveling with the White House. But Multiple there's a lot of ballots that got lost. This apparently. is my question, okay? So you, I'm not going to apologize to you or anybody else for my active duty uh, experience and for my, my, my time in service until you put that uniform on, Mr. Weingartner, and you go over there in the combat zones of Iraq and Afghanistan, and you're away from your family for 9 to 12 months out of the year. Don't lecture me about your ability to vote. I, I, I'm done with that. I'm not going to apologize to you. You have no idea what it's like to serve in the military. You have no appreciation for our military. You have no respect for our military. And you've, de you've, uh, you've demonstrated that time and time again, including in the negative ads that you're running right now against me involving my military career. So I will not apologize. I've voted every election. I've had, voted absentee in the United States Navy. And uh, I voted for President Trump. And I will not apologize to you or anyone else for my time in the military. I'm not asking for an apology, it's just a straight answer. It just, yeah, I just gave you a straight answer. But you, you didn't vote. I did vote. 
I did there's vote. No I record. voted absentee. There's no record of a request. It doesn't for a matter. Ballot. I voted absentee, Mr. Weingarten. That's you part were of the in problem. The White House. They, they don't even count the votes sometimes in the military unless it's I contested. know, and I think you're making light of a serious situation. I think because you I were think actually you were in Washington for straws, Mr. Weingarten. Your you campaign is in so Maryland, empty. Gentlemen, let's Washington, get back to the issue at hand. Let's move on to the next question that we have. You can't hang your hat on anything but that. We don't want to take up too much time with this issue. Let's move on. We have a limited number of time, so we'll move on to the next question that we have, Dr. Jackson. This is specifically concerning you and your okay. time in the White House. So yes. We can continue talking about that a bit. It's been called into question by some of your previous colleagues. You retired while you, an investigation was happening um, before you could be awarded your second star uh, right. as an admiral. Um, the Department of Defense, it's been reported, is still investigating your time at the White House. Um, what would you say to voters who are concerned about those allegations from your, your previous colleagues? I would tell you those allegations are complete garbage. They're nothing but lies. They were, un they were, they were unanimous, unsubstantiated lies that were put out there by the far left and by the liberal press to tear me down as President Trump's nominee. They've gone after multiple nominees for President Trump. I was one of the first ones that happened, but it's happened multiple times since then, including Justice Kavanaugh. I tell people, folks, I didn't, I tell folks all the time, I didn't know it at the time, but I got Kavanaugh before Kavanaugh did. I was the pregame, I was the warm up. And what happened to me was a perfect example of exactly what happened to Justice Kavanaugh earlier on. It's just a bunch of lies and, uh, and unsubstantiated, uh, completely false accusations, like I said, that were, uh, they were for no other purpose than to tear me down as uh, President Trump's nominee. The sad part of this whole thing is my opponent right here has started recycling all that garbage in a Republican race here in the 13th Congressional District, and he has proven that he's no better than those folks at MSNBC, CNN, and on the far left in the liberal press. And so, uh, like I said before, uh, desperation reveals character, and that's what we're seeing here. Mr. Weingartner, a question for you specifically now, um, concerning the president, concerning the the Republican Party. Do Are I you get disappointed? A chance to go toward that too. Um, I mean, you can answer uh, in this question okay. certainly. Um, Are you disappointed that you did not get the endorsement of President Trump? Well, let, let me answer the, what he said first. Okay. Um, these are allegations from 23 of his military colleagues. Not no, they're just, not. No, they're not. not. not you just, have no idea what you're talking Mr. about. Jackson. Not just uh, not just people that are political appointees in the White House. And they seem to be enough that the Republican-controlled Senate was the one that, that sent back your, your request for a no, second star. No, they, they did also, not withdrew that. No, you withdrew your nomination withdrew for the VA. Mr. Jackson. Not for your okay. second star. You don't know what happened. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. But, yeah, so... Uh, the, the, these things are, are, he likes to say it's all politically motivated, but he had a number of Democratic members, uh, Democratic staffers supporting his nomination to the VA. So I don't know no, where I he didn't. thinks it was, it was Democratic driven. I Mr. Weingarten, I'll thought. ask you the same question once again. Are you disappointed that you did not get the endorsement of the president? I, I would have loved to have the, the president's endorsement. Uh, I think anybody would that supports the president, uh, and I do. Uh, but uh, what I think I'm, I'm really glad at, about is that I had the endorsement of almost 40 percent of the voters in this district during the first time around. That means more to me than, than almost anything because I know that, that the people uh, that, that came out to vote saw me as the, the candidate that they most preferred. Mr. Jackson, we can give you 30 seconds to follow up. Well, I hate to disappoint you, Mr. Weingarner, but a lot of those votes belong to me now, and we're about to see that on the 14th of July. And, uh, you know, he, you, didn't get, you didn't get President Trump's uh, endorsement because Tres President Trump endorsed me. And he normally doesn't get involved in, in primaries. But he did because he understands that you're a never Trump rhino Republican. That's who you are. And, he, and you did not get his endorsement for that very reason. And uh, I got the president's endorsement because I have the trust and the confidence of the president. He knows I'm going to have his back. I've worked side by side with him every day for the last three years. And, uh, and he knows that when push comes to shove, that I won't be standing in the corner somewhere hiding when he's in a bind. Mr. Weingartner, 30 seconds for you to respond, then we'll move on to the next topic. I don't know where you get that I'm a never Trump or anything. I mean, Will Hurd. Let's try Will Hurd. Mr. For, Jackson. Your, your club for growth endorsement, they were the original never Trumpers. Are you kidding me? So was Chris Extra. Yeah. One of the other guys that's gotten on your campaign and, and that you, you seem to be pushing out his stuff. So both of them were the or original never Trumpers. Well, almost every Republican that was in this race with you and me is on my side right now. Absolutely not. Just not. Uh, ten out of the 13 I are supporting so. me. I think I, so. I think ten you, out of the 13. You, you need to learn how to count. Yeah, uh, ten out of, and you're, and, and I call you an, a rhino and a never Republican. Why don't you explain to people why one of your biggest supporters is Will Hurd? Will Hurd called the president a racist. Mr. Will Jackson, Hurd is you are words. intruding on Mr. Weingartner's time oh, here. Oh, he just turned it over to me. I don't think so. Okay, go ahead. But no, Will Hurd is, is not one of my biggest supporters. Will he Hurt is a is supporter, but yeah. he's not one of my biggest supporters. 
Yeah. And the president also said, Will Hurd's a great guy. What? Yeah. yeah. No, we obviously so. have a lot to say, yeah. but again, more ground to mm -hmm. cover uh, in addition to, to this spat here. And I believe we've just run out of time on those questions. So let's go ahead and get your responses. We'll ask Mr. Weingarner first, how do our local economies recover after what's happened to this nation and the 13th district over the past three or four months? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the things that we can, we can really count on as we move forward is if we can reduce the regulatory burden that is, has been placed on us by the federal government, whether it be the Department of Labor, whether it be tax issues, environmental issues, if we can remove much of that burden, and the President has done a great job of this. He has relaxed a number of regulations through COVID. He has asked his agencies to put a list together for him of all the regulations that, that, that could be, that, that are useless, that could be pulled back. If we can do that, that will be the ultimate stimulus for our economy because that will give the entrepreneur spirit that's ripe in this district, the people that want to go out and take a risk, that'll give them that opportunity. And that's how we really stimulate, and, uh, stimulate our economy. Uh, one of the things that I've been pushing back from the start is Dodd-Frank. Uh, when, we, when we keep people from being able to get a loan to help them start a business, that's when we've really created a situation where we can't continue to to function in our economy. Okay, Dr. Jackson, you have 60 seconds. Good, I'll just start by saying, uh, you know, I just wanna reply, uh, Mr. Weingartner, believe me, I know what President Trump thinks about Will Hurd, and he does not think Will Hurd's a good guy. Will Hurd called him a racist, and uh, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Number two, if you say you wanna support President Trump, I got a suggestion for you. If you really wanna support our president, you should do what he's asked everybody in this district to do, and that's vote for Ronnie Jackson. All right, and uh, so back to the question on how we uh, recover the economy. I think the way we recover the economy right now is that we get in there and we aggressively get people back to work. We've got to get people back to work. Okay. And you know, I think we need to diversify our community as well. We need to take advantage of certain things that are going on right here. You know, COVID has devastated our economy, uh, not just to, in this district, but all over this country. But there's opportunity in that. You know, I've been talking to folks a, a lot about some of the opportunity that's coming from that. And we're working really hard right now in Amarillo, Texas, to bring a large pharmaceutical generic uh, drug manufacturing plant to Amarillo. There's going to be a big push in Congress right now, led by the president, and then in, uh, un, uh, uh, unusually endorsed by both the right and the left, to bring pharmaceutical manufacturing back from China. It's been considered a national security issue now. It's coming back somewhere in this district. It might as well come back here to the 13th congressional. It's coming back to this country. It might as well come to the 13th congressional district, and we're going to make that happen in Amarillo. In addition to that, we've got oper opportunities with Shepard Air Force Base. We've got the fifth branch of the military now. The fifth branch of the military hasn't been defined yet. We don't know what that mission set's going to be, and I'm going to work hard to make the, sure that a large part of that mission set from Space Force comes right here to Shepard Air Force okay. Base. Okay, and time's up there. You do have 30 seconds if you'd like to respond to any of that, Mr. Weingarten. Sure. Uh, Shepard is vital to the community here, obviously, and it's something that we have to continue to look at and, and try to find new missions that will help expand that. Uh, this economy in, in Wichita Falls specifically, it, it, it's vital to continue. We saw the, the Texas Comptroller came out and showed that that four point, it provides $4.5 billion in, in the local economy. So it, it's not just important locally, though. It's important to our, our, our communities, and it's important to our, uh, our national defense. Uh, and then with regard to the, to the pharmaceutical manufacturing, I, I think it's a great idea. It's something that, that no, a number of us in Amarillo have been working on for the last five years when we were working on trying to attract the Texas Tech Vet School to Amarillo, when we were working on uh, trying to, to bring in the Texas A&M component of the vet school to Canyon. Uh, it's not a new concept that, that my opponent's talking about. Okay, and Dr. Jackson, you have 30 if you uh, so choose. Well, it's absolutely a new concept. It's unbelievable the number of times that you take the things that I bring up and you try to make them your own. It's ridiculous that you're going to that you're going to say that this plan that we're developing right now for bringing a large generic pharmaceutical manufacturing plant, based on what's going on in this country right now, is, is, is that, that that you've been working on this for five years. That is absolutely ridiculous. It's comical, actually. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, you go ahead and continue. Uh, your 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 mo right now is to tear me down and negative campaign against me and then occasionally uh, take all the good ideas I have, we try to run with them and make them your own. Shepard Air Force Base is a perfect example as well. I've been talking about Shepard okay, Air Force Base since the day the I got in this race. And for that rebuttal on this question. Gentlemen, I do want to ask you on our next topic here. You're obviously both conservatives. You both espouse conservative values. You say that you have, you know, you hold fast to Republican values and, and a Republican platform. Uh, that we can all agree on. You're running on the Republican primary ballot. Obviously, that's, that's where you are. So split some hairs for our voters and our viewers tonight. 
what are the things that differentiate you from your opponent? Uh, regardless of endorsements and primary votes, we've already kind of talked about those. So, so aside from those, what are some of the things that, that you have that you hope to bring to Congress that will differentiate you from each other? Uh, Dr. Jackson, that question goes to you first. Well, I said first, uh, first it's relationships. I've got relationships, he's got relationships. His relationships are all built as a lobbyist, as a registered lobbyist for the last 14 years on the exchange of money. And he's got, he's, got, he's got bills to pay if he gets to Congress. I don't, I don't have any such relationships. My relationships are built on my time in the White House over the last three years. I know every single one of the cabinet secretaries. I, have, I know them by name. I have their phone number. I have their home phone number and their cell phone number. Uh, the big difference here is we're about to have a freshman congressman in this uh, district, and a freshman congressman by nature doesn't really have any, uh, doesn't have a lot of influence in this district, or doesn't have a lot of influence in Congress. It's just the nature of the game. I'm going to be the exception to that because I can bring influence to this district. I can protect things like Shepherd Air Force Base, and I can grow and protect our economy here. That's because of the relationships that I have in the White House, in the cabinet, whether it's agriculture, commerce, energy, defense, the VA, whatever it is, I know those people. They're going to answer the phone. They're going to know how they can help me. I'm the only, I will be, if I'm blessed enough to represent this district, the only freshman congressman that walk, can walk into the Oval Office unannounced and tell the President of the United States, sir, I've got something I've got to make you aware of, and he will stop what he's doing and Dr. listen Dr. Jackson, to me. I do want to ask a follow-up question to that, because there is, there is the, the potential that this administration will not be reelected in the fall, that you could be dealing with a Democratic um, a, a Democratic president, a Democratic House, potentially a Democratic Senate. How do your relationships play into that if, if that plays out that way, where we get a new administration? Well, my relationships obviously uh, you know, aren't the same if that takes place, but I've got 25, 25 years of leadership experience. You know, I spent four years in the reserves and 25 years on active duty. I've spent 29 years wearing this nation's uniform. I retired as a Navy Admiral. I've got the leadership experience that we need. I'm a veteran. I'm a physician. I can work on a lot of these issues. I've got a lot of corporate knowledge. I bring a lot to the fight, regardless of who's there. But I'll just reassure you right now, President Trump is getting reelected. He's going to get another four years. I'm going to get elected as congressman in this district, and we're going to make a huge impact on what's going on in this district. Mr. Weingartner, the same question for you. What separates you from your opponent? Well, I think one of the key things is I've actually worked on policy issues uh, that are important to this district, uh, fighting back, pushing back against things like the Green New Deal, uh, pushing back against uh, uh, a number of tax, thing, tax uh, bills that have come out that, that, were, that would have been detrimental to a number of industries, working to make that uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that the President worked on so hard even better uh, because we addressed issues that, that could have been substantially harmful to areas in, in, in this district specifically. So I know how to, those things work. I also know that, that being a member of Congress, being your representative is not just about taking votes. It's also about being an advocate for this district and making sure that you've got somebody in Washington that if you've got an issue, can pick up the phone and go down and talk to the Social Security Administration because your neighbor hadn't gotten her check for three years, or three weeks, or three months, rather. Uh, that, that you can continue to have those, those dialogues with those, those agencies to make sure that those issues are taken care of in addition to voting the things that your district wants you to vote. Okay, this next question for both of you gentlemen. What is your most significant professional setback you've ever had, and how did you overcome it? Mr. Weingartner? Oh, I guess that uh, that's a great question that I hadn't prepared for, but uh, I think it, it's probably, uh, uh, it'd have to be uh, the first time I, I was in, in D.C. and uh, was uh, just not sure what I was, what the boss really wanted me to do. And because uh, I, I want to make sure that I get it right for the people uh, that, that he was representing. And I wanted to make sure that, that that was something that we got accomplished. And uh, that, I guess that was maybe, I'd never want to let anybody down like that. And, and that was something that was probably uh, an issue. And, and I overcame that. And, and I made uh, constituent service a really big part of, of what I did. And what I do today is making sure that I'm always listening to the constituents. I'm always making sure that it's, it's them that we're listening to and them that we're working for, not, uh, not for our own beliefs. What year was that when you were there for oh, the first time? Oh, it would have time? been 2000. 
back in 2000. Okay, Dr. Jackson, same question to you. Well, I'd say my biggest uh, professional setback was probably related to what we were talking about earlier. Whenever uh, you know I was the president's nominee for the secretary of the VA, and that didn't work out, and I went to the president, and I talked to the president, and we decided that you know there was uh, you know that that, that uh, we, there was a better way for me to serve, and you know I came to that conclusion on my own. I talked to the president about it. I didn't leave the White House. The president actually promoted me after that to assistant to the president, made me one of his senior advisors. I was his chief medical advisor for the next uh, year and a half. Uh, but for the first six months or so, I was disgusted with DC. I just wanted to get out of there. I wanted to move back home to Texas and get away from it. Uh, but I didn't. The way I overcame that was uh, I, uh, I started to realize that uh, that my uh, my time in service wasn't over, that I was getting ready to retire from active duty and take the uniform off, but the service to my country wasn't over. Uh, and that I was going to continue to serve my country. I didn't know exactly what that looked like, but now I do. I've stepped up to the plate, and uh, that experience led me to where I'm at right now. Uh, and I think I'm in a better position right now. Uh, personally, I think I'm in a better position uh, to, uh, to help the president with his agenda to, to keep America great, and that's what I intend to do. So I just overcame that by realizing that I still had service left in me, and uh, I wanted to make a difference, and that's what I'm doing. Gentlemen, the next question for both of you. I want to talk a little bit about agriculture and I want to talk about immigration but let's start with let's start with agriculture what is your vision you know obviously district 13 relies very heavily on agriculture there's so many different facets of that that we rely on uh, in our district and, and all the way across our district truly so if you are elected to Congress what's your vision for keeping business as far as agriculture is concerned in district 13 dr. Jackson to you first well, I think that, you know, uh, one of the first things I want to do is, uh, you, you know, we, we get asked frequently about what committees we're going to sit on, and agriculture is important uh, to this uh, to this district. Therefore, it's important to me as the representative for this district. I'm going to get on the uh, on the Ag Committee, and I'm going to be an active member of the Ag Committee. I'm going to work hard with uh, farmers and ranchers all over this district. I'm not going to rely on folks from D.C., uh, special interest groups and lobbyists uh, to dictate uh, what my, uh, my position on issues are. I'm going to rely on people that live and work right here in this district that I'm going to be around on, on, a, on a continuous basis to tell me uh, what the issues are and how we fix them so that's first and foremost and we need to get up there and we need to educate folks about what goes on down here we need to continue uh, on our, with our deregulatory efforts uh, to make uh, things prosperous down here we need to work on the things like we talked about before uh, with our rural community and uh, you know and, and take care of uh, our rural health care and things of that nature but uh, I, I uh, I'm gonna work hard uh, to make sure that uh, Texas agriculture is in the forefront of everything that happens uh, uh, up uh, in DC Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Dr. Or Mr. Weingartner, to you. Yeah, so, so our district, the 13th district, is the seventh largest agriculture producing district in the country. Agriculture is vital to this district. It is our backbone, along with oil and gas and our small businesses. Uh, it is going to be one of my main focuses when I get up there. And one of the, the chief things that we can do to continue to, to have uh, a powerful agriculture community is to reduce the regulatory burden that continues to, 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 to plague a number of producers reduce that environmental burden that, that is put on them, deal with our labor and our tax issues, and then we've got to continue to have markets for our products. And having sound trade agreements, like uh, working with President Trump on, on the China trade d agreement to, to get more of our products uh, to China to be able to, uh, to sell those and get a higher value for them. Uh, continuing to push out to Japan, South Korea, other countries, that, especially on beef, they love our beef. We produce the best beef in the world and those are huge markets for us and they continuously want to buy our products. So having those opportunities for us to be able to sell our products around the world is going to continue to strengthen our district. Congressman Max Thornberry was running for Congress way back in 1994. He was elected with the Republican wave, took control of the House for the first time in 40 years. He was there for 25 years. A lot of people think that was a great thing. The chairman of the House Armed Services Committee much experience. Power that goes along with that could help the 13th district. Let's let the voters in the 13th district know how long you all might stay in office. When you think about the future, uh, let's talk about term limits. Are we just looking at a couple of terms or would you like to make a career out of this? I, I don't want to make a career out of it. What I want to do is serve as long as I can be effective for this district, making sure that I'm actually doing the job that people are electing me for. Uh, I'm not going to give you an arbitrary number because I don't know what that number is. I, I don't want to be elected today and, and then tell you that I'm going to stay for a certain number of years and the constituents say, well, but you're doing a good job. We think you need to continue and then have to backtrack on something. That's not what I'm going to do. I do believe in term limits. Uh, I signed the term limits pledge. Uh, but what we have to do if we're going to impose term limits for 
all, we need to do it for all of Congress. It needs to be a constitutional amendment so that everybody is playing by the same rules. The biggest uh, mistake we could make would be to have a term limits imposed on just this district or this state so that we had always the, the, the far left coast and the right coast uh, having senior members and ours would always be a freshman or sophomore member. We would never have that seniority. We wouldn't have that same effectiveness. So in order to represent this district, I want to serve as long as this district will allow me and as long as my wife will allow me. But I'm not staying forever. This is not a new career for me. This is not something I want to do because I'm not leaving home. I'm staying in, in Randall County. Okay, Dr. Jackson. Well, this is where me and my opponent differ as well. You know, I signed the term limits pledge as well. It's a useless piece of paper. I mean, it is. It's an out for career politicians and lobbyists like my opponent uh, so that they can tell you that they're for term limits uh, when their intention is to go there and make a career. And uh, if Mr. Weingarten gets elected, his intention is to stay just like his predecessor did for 26 years and make a career out of it. He's already documented that in the previous debate we had. Uh, we talked about term limits and how long we're going to stay. And he was asking me, what would I do whenever 10 years was up and I was going to be offered a committee chairmanship? Would I walk away and I told him I'm not worried about what happens in 10 years I'm worried about what happens in January when I show up I'm not gonna wait 10 years until I get a committee chair to start making a difference in this district I'm gonna start using the impact that I have from day one I have I have uh, relationships that are in place I'm gonna get in there I'm gonna make a huge difference for this district from day one not 10 years out and I will tell you how long I'm gonna stay I'm gonna stay 8 to 10 years I've already done 25 years in the United States Navy I've got a full career I'm gonna get in there and I'm making a massive impact for this district and then I'm gonna turn it over to somebody who's just as fired up as an, and enthusiastic as I am about making a difference. Would you make that pledge tonight? Absolutely. That after, after 10 years, you would leave the 13th district? I'm district. telling you right now, 10 years from now, I will, I will leave. I will serve this district. I will serve it well. I will make a name for this district. I will do incredible things for this district over the next 10 years, but I will not stay after 10 years. I, I'm a firm believer in term limits, and I think we have to lead by example. That's what they teach us in the United States Navy. Uh, that, that's why I, I finished in the Navy as a United States Navy Admiral, uh, because I lead by example example and that's what I intend to do. Okay, Mr. Weingarner, would you make uh, such a pledge and is there anything you'd like to respond in, in his rebuttal? Well, he, the first time he made this pledge it was six to eight years and now it's eight to ten years. So he's already added two years to the term that he said he was going to promise to keep. So uh, I, that's why, again, that's why I, I think it's just pandering to give you a number because we don't know the circumstances. We don't know what this district's going to need where I can be most effective to this district. I would hate for, I would hate to be in a situation where we were working, say it's the next farm bill, and I had the opportunity to be, to be a chairman of that committee working on a farm bill that was that important to this district. Why would I walk away from the, the, the constituents at that point when we could make sure that we were really driving the agenda for this district? And gentlemen, I want to ask you about um, immigration and about the border wall. I know you both support President Trump and you support many of his uh, ideas on immigration, but frankly, we rely on a lot of immigrant labor in the 13th district, from meat packing plants to our producers, our farmers, our uh, you know those those type of industries that we rely on so heavily in our district. So, how do you marry those two things? What is your plan on immigration, Dr. Jackson? That question goes to you first. Well, I think I, I know quite a lot about the immigration issue that we have in this country right now. The president sent me down to the border uh, five times over the last uh, two years that I was at the White House to gather information on the border, and I was down there. I was up and down that border. I flew up and down the border, drove up and down the border. I met with Customs and Border Protection, Border Patrol, ICE, HHS, everybody involved up there, and I know what these issues are. First and foremost, we have to completely stop illegal immigration. It has to stop completely. We've got to stop the drug traffickers, the human traffickers, the heroin, the methamphetamine, all the stuff that's coming across, the drug cartels and the gangs. Uh, they're destroying our country from the inside out. We do have to reform legal immigration and we have to come up with a good solid guest worker program. That does not include certain things like my opponent has lobbied for in, in increasing the number of refugees that we have here. That's a completely different program. That's an Obama era program where we had refugees coming across here and anybody who wanted to coming from anywhere in this world and they weren't coming from Mexico, they were coming from Southeast Asia and from Africa, from countries that notoriously are hostile towards us. They were coming over here, and Amarillo had the highest number of refugees out of any uh, city in this uh, country per capita in 2014, and he lobbied to keep it. Dr. Jackson, thank you. Mr. Weingartner, what's your plan on immigration? So I, the first thing we have to do is we have to finish building the wall. We have to be able to keep the drug traffickers and the human traffickers out of our country. Uh, and we've got to keep the, the, the terrorists from coming across porous borders. So we have to have that wall in place. We have to use other technologies to continue to patrol it. 
and we have to give our Border Patrol the resources they need uh, to be able to do that job. I adamantly oppose amnesty. We've got to hold all of our immigration to the same set of standards. Anyone that wants to come into this country has to do so legally and they have to follow the same standards as anybody else. That also includes the people that are already here illegally. We need to hold them to the same standards as, as we would anybody trying to immigrate. And then we have to reform our immigration system. We have to make it uh, so that it's usable and it benefits the United States of America. Uh, we have too many people in this country that first came here legally on a visa program and they overstayed the visa. That's what a large part of our illegal population is today. And we've got to fix that. And I'm committed to doing that. Thank you, as fun as this has been, as much as we'd like it to continue, we've come to the portion of this debate where now each of you will have a uh, an opportunity to have a closing statement. And because, Mr. Weingartner, you were able to go first and address our viewers at home, Dr. Jackson, you will be able to have the last statement. So, Mr. Weingartner, if you would, uh, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. So I appreciate this opportunity to be in front of you tonight to, to talk to the constituents of this district. Uh, I'm running to represent you. I'm not running just to be another congressman. I'm running to be your representative. Someone that's listening to you and is going up to Washington to, to be your advocate. Uh, I'm also committing that uh, my wife and I are not moving to Washington. We want our kids raised in rural Randall County. We want them to have the same opportunities that, that, that we had growing up and to give them that, that same sense of culture, that same sense of, uh, of value that we see in the Texas Panhandle. So I, that also means that I'm going to be back, and I want to be back with you, listening to your concerns, listening to the, the issues that you think are the most important, and truly being your representative. That's what this job is, is your representative and your advocate on the issues that matter to you. Dr. Jackson, you have 60 seconds. So I'd just like to tell the voters here, I think we, uh, over the last few weeks, especially in this race, uh, with all the negative campaigning that's going on from my opponent, I think that uh, folk, folks can see that they have a choice to make this time. The choice is between a leader or a lobbyist, and that's really how this plays out. You know, I was born and raised right here in the state of Texas. I was born and raised in the panhandle of Texas. I left 25 years ago to serve my country. I put the uniform on. I just retired from the Navy 20, uh, after 25 years of service on December 1st of this last year. I spent my last three years as President Trump Trump's personal physician, one of his senior advisors. I just left the White House on December the 1st. Uh, I'm in this race for the right reasons. Uh, I can represent this district without changing anything about who I am or what I believe. I agree with the people in this district uh, politically, socially, culturally, economically across the board. And, uh, you know, I've got President Trump's endorsement because he doesn't need any more rhinos or never Trump Republicans in the, in the House of Representatives right now. We've had plenty of those. So I make the voters two promises. Number one, if you vote for me, I promise that I will make you proud. And number two, I promise that everyone in this country will know who the representative from the 13th Congressional District is because I'm going to be a loud, proud voice for this state, for this district, and for you. That Thank does you. conclude our debate between the Republicans who are in a runoff election currently for Congressional District 13. We again want to thank both of our candidates for making thank time you. to be here tonight. We really, truly appreciate it for participating, for being here, and thanks to all of you at home for being here with us as well. Yeah, stay tuned because coming up at the top of the hour, our second debate is coming up between two candidates. They're running for the Democratic runoff election. We've got Greg Sagan and we have Gus Trujillo standing by and ready to take the stage. to go ahead and send it over to Dr. Jackson. Sure. Dr. Jackson, you have 60 seconds. Absolutely not. Uh, now that we've educated ourselves, we know from experience what this virus is really... Education gap forming between students who have Wi-Fi and who do not... Things that, that we experienced during COVID was that when you have two working parents on Zoom calls and then you've got two kids... Public health crisis were to happen or a second wave of COVID-19. Start with you, Josh Weingartner. Uh, step before... Well, I didn't give money to any Democrats. The organization I work for has a PAC board that, that you determines were that. I'm not on that. You That's weren't. actually elected individuals or appointed individuals that, that, uh, that want to be on that board. 
they make those determina determinations on who they're going to give contributions to. So, I, I, my, my Republican credentials are uh, without question. I've been an active member of the Republican Party for a number of years. I have been voting in Republican primaries. Okay, so intense is a good way to describe this. Weingartner returned by questioning Ronnie Jackson's voting record. Uh, Weingartner even went so far as to accuse him of not voting for President Trump in the previous election. Let's check in with Ronnie Jackson's response. I did vote for President Trump, and that's part of the reason. I voted absentee in the United States military. Not all of us have the opportunity to walk. I, I voted Maryland. where I was assigned on active duty, Mr. Weingartner. But it wasn't like you were apologize. overseas. I'm not going to, well, you don't know where I was. I was in Afghanistan part of that time right before the election. You don't know. You keep saying you were in the White House. I was, I was in the White House. I was in Afghanistan traveling with the White House. But there's a lot of ballots that got lost, This apparently. is my question, okay? So you, I'm not going to apologize to you or anybody else for my active duty uh, experience and for my, my, my time in service until you put that uniform on, Mr. Weingartner, and you go over there in the combat zones of Iraq and Afghanistan, and you're away from your family for 9 to 12 months out of the year. Don't lecture me about your ability to vote. I, I, I'm done with that. I'm not going to apologize to you. You have no idea what it's like to serve in the military. You have no appreciation for our military. You have no respect for our military. And you've, de you've, uh, you've demonstrated that time and time again, including in the negative ads that you're running right now against me involving my military career. So I will not apologize. I've voted every election. Just, you'd like to go ahead and send uh, it over to uh, Dr. And th those are just two Dr. snippets Jackson, from this seconds. entire hour Absolutely long thing. So we're going to wrap this thing up as the Democrats are taking the stage. The Democratic candidates uh, looking uh, forming between uh, students to, who have to, Wi-Fi to and who do in not. Election. That, that we experienced so during COVID was that when you have two working parents on Zoom calls and then you've got two kids. Public health crisis were to happen or a second wave of COVID-19. Start with you, Josh Weingartner.